Good morning to all of you. Thank you for being here this morning on this beautiful spring Sunday morning. As we mentioned at the outset of our Bible class period, this is the beginning of our spring gospel meeting, and especially if you are visiting with us this morning. Thank you for being here. We're so very thankful that you, you have taken the time to join us. We ask if you would to take the time to fill out a visitor's card that should be uh, all along the row of chairs in front of you. If you would take the time to fill that out and drop it in the baskets toward the end of our time together, we would certainly very much appreciate that. We're going to start in just a few moments by singing, I will wake the dawn with praises. It's a phrase that comes from Psalm 108. It is a psalm of David, and it very effectively centers our minds where they ought to be this morning. Undoubtedly, we have all had busy past weeks. We're anticipating a busy coming week. But we set aside this first day of the week in accordance with the will of our Lord, as we do every first day of the week, to remember what He has done for us, to remember the cost that was paid for our redemption, to rejoice in His resurrection from the dead, to dedicate ourselves anew to being living sacrifices, worthy, acceptable, humble in His sight. We encourage you to pay attention to what we're singing this morning, as we seek to set our minds where they ought to be at the beginning of this new week. In that Psalm 108, verse 1, David wrote, My heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing and make melody with all my being. Let me encourage you to do that this morning. Not just to use your mouth, but to engage your God-given being. To engage your God-given heart. He says in the latter part of verse 2, I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. And so this song looks at various aspects of creation, from the stars to the lesser light. It's the way that the moon is described in the book of Genesis to us as people created in his image. All of us singing the praises of God together. Let's focus our minds on that. We will sing all three verses of number 11 from our supplements. I will wake the dawn with praises. Dawn and sunset hears and joyful ease reflect his mighty Forever. 
our supplement books. For you have promised. The reason that we're able to sing today is because our Heavenly Father is always faithful. Faithful to everything that he has promised. We'll sing all four verses. We'll sing the third verse softly. The third verse softly until we get to the chorus. And the chorus of each verse we will sing a little faster. For you have promised. O oh, Father, all he goes to you, for now my spirit and peace approach your throne in prayer this morning. Sing praises unto your name. To you we give all glory and honor. We recognize that we are a sinful people. That as Paul exclaimed in his letter that, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? We know that deliverer is Christ. 
through your love and his example of obedience, his example of perfection, we know that we can have redemption and salvation. And we are just so thankful for your love and your grace and your mercy towards us. As we begin this study of sin and addiction, help us to have open minds, to have open hearts, to know that we are full of sin. We can read in your word that righteousness will exalt a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Help us as a nation to be righteous, to use your word as our guidance. Help us as individuals to be righteous, to know what that means. To know that if we are sin, we are sinful. That means separation from you. We pray that you would be with each one of us this morning. Help us to seek you first. To put aside all the cares and the burdens of this world. And to seek you first. We pray that this service will be pleasing to you, Father, and would be according to your word. And all these things we ask in your Son's name, in Jesus' name, amen. One of the most difficult things of all when it comes to sin and addiction is the idea that we are all alone, very easy to convince ourselves when we are in slave to sin that we are all alone. This song reminds us, just as Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 4, when he said that at my, defer, at my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. And then he very quickly follows that up by telling us, but the Lord stood by me. We're talking about difficult things over the course of the next few days. We want to sing the two verses of this song to remind us that there is a place we can stand where no one stands alone. Once I stood in the dark.
Let me begin by expressing my sincere appreciation to the eldership here and the congregation for the invitation to be back with you. I thoroughly enjoyed the last meeting that we had a few years ago. At that time, I lived in Ohio up at uh, Brown Street. I was preaching for the congregation there. Since then, my wife and I have moved uh, back to Indiana, and I'm working with the Westfield Church uh, on the north side of Indianapolis. But I'm delighted to have this opportunity to be back with you, and uh, I believe that the subject matter is a very relevant, very important one that hopefully all of us can uh, gain some insight into and learn some very valuable, important lessons. Very encouraged to see uh, how uh, dedicated you are still in this community to, to doing the work of the Lord, uh, the enthusiasm with which you have engaged in worship this morning. I think the songs have uh, been very fitting to prepare our minds for what we're going to be talking about. Again, the darkness of sin and the addiction to sin. I was thinking about uh, that idea of the loneliness of, of, of sin and addiction and the story of the prodigal son. And here was a, a, a son that uh, had a very good home and, and a, a loving father. Uh, and he chose to leave that, and, and as the text tells us, went into the far country, which we could kind of say is the far country of sin, wasted all of his substance and riotous living, uh, and, and basically then what? He found himself alone, completely alone. Uh, and the text puts it very well when it said, and no one cared for his soul. And when you leave God behind, when you go on your own and follow the carnal pleasures of the world and, and leave God, you may have friends, quote, for a while that will live it up with you, but then eventually you're going to find the dark side and the darkness of sin and certainly the darkness of addiction to sin. And one of the things that we're going to be talking about this morning uh, is one of those areas that can definitely have its uh, chilling effect on our lives in the addictive appeal of alcohol. And this is a subject that we want to spend our time for the next uh, few moments looking at and thinking about uh, today. And this is something that uh, is an amazing thing to me when you think about the difference between how we grow up, especially in a good home with parents that are watching over us. And I think about how sheltered children are as they're young and they're growing up in the home. And then we get out into the real world. And, and you know, when you work in a day-to-day -day, uh, world like we live in today, one of the things that you're going to find is the number of people that, again, are addicted to alcohol, the number of people that believe in order to have a good time, it must involve alcohol. Uh, and, and they live for the weekends and, and living it up and drinking. And so many things involve alcohol. And they can't even imagine a life without it. And I think about the average young person that goes off to college today and, and how addicted young people become very quickly to the use of alcohol. And once again, they're drawn in no doubt by peer pressure. They're drawn in by wanting to fit in, but too often with the wrong crowd. And then it takes over. Then it controls them. And in many cases, as we will see in this lesson, it will destroy them. But from that innocence, from that sheltered in the world to a point in time where uh, this is something that is pushed and, and expected. And, you know, even uh, you may uh, work in, a, in a, a corporation or in a job where it's just expected. You know, you go on a business trip, then alcohol is expected to be a part of that. And it becomes so much a part of day-to-day -day life. I want to read you a quote from Gen uh, General... William Henry Harrison, years and years ago when uh, he was running for president. Uh, and he said, gentlemen, I have twice refused to partake of the wine cup. That should, have been, that should have been sufficient. Though you press the cup to my lips, not a drop shall pass the portals. I made a resolve when I started in life that I would avoid strong drink, and I have never broken it. Then he went on to say, I am one of a class of 17 young men who graduated and the other 16 filled drunkards' graves all through the pernicious habit of wine drinking. I owe my health, happiness, and prosperity to that resolve. I find that to be very interesting, that quote. 
And a rare individual who refused to go along with this, refused to be a part of this, when he said 16 out of 17 I graduated with are in drunkard's graves. You don't even have to be religious or look at it from a spiritual standpoint to see this morning the dangers of what I'm talking about. But hopefully the combination of the two will help you see the dangers of what we're talking about, the wisdom that is found in the Word of God in regard to the use of alcohol. There is very strong support from God's Word for General Harrison's pledge that not a drop of it will pass my portals. Not a drop of it will I allow uh, to be a part of my body because of the evil effects that I see in regard to it. Now, in the book of Galatians, the fifth chapter, we find there in the 19th verse what Paul calls the works of the flesh. And I think all Christians understand that a part of that list, a part of things that he says is a part of this carnal mind we were discussing in our, in our Bible class, is the idea of drunkenness. He says in verse 19, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, envy, and then in the middle of that, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. And he said, I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. We know that drunkenness for the child of God is a sin. It's called the work of the flesh. And those who practice such, he said, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But now there's another verse because a lot of Christians are deceived, I think, and just like we talked about the deceptiveness of sin and how easy it is to believe things that, that you want to believe anyway that would make it easier in your day-to-day -day life. You know, as a Christian, when you go on a business trip and everybody else is drinking, it really is challenging to your faith to say, no, I don't drink. Uh, and, and maybe know that it might even affect your job or whatever. It'd be a lot easier if you knew it was okay, I could go along as long as I don't get drunk. You see, uh, and it's easy to justify, if I don't get drunk, then this will be okay. I know drunkenness is a sin, but I can control this. Peter goes further, really, than even what Paul says in regard to drunkenness in talking about putting off the old man of sin. He said, the time passed of our life, when was that? Before we became a Christian. The time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revel, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Paul is saying we've spent enough of our lifetime living in sin. We don't need that to be any part of of our life now as a child of God. That was the old man that should have been put off. We don't need to be living that way as Christians is what he's saying. But what I want you to focus on here are the three levels of the use of alcohol that Paul brings out. These words that are uh, translated in our English version do not readily portray to us the real meaning of what he is saying here. We don't understand by revelings uh, and banquetings what he really is talking about. The first word in the original that is used here is literally for, for the word drunkenness, where the person again is, is just truly drunk. He's gone way too far, unable to control himself, and uh, he is drunk. He has clearly done what was condemned by Paul in Galatians 5 there. But the next word is not as drunk as the first one. This revelries is still more the one who's the life of the party. He's still living it up. It's not to the level of the other, but he's getting there. You know, he's on his way. He's partying. He may be the one dancing on the uh, table with the lampshade on his head. You know, he's still enjoying himself where the other one may have passed out. Then the third one is simply drinking parties. We have another word for it, social drinking. That's what Paul's talking about. The third term really doesn't even have anything to do with the amount that is being drunk. This can be the one who is not getting drunk. He's not even to the level of comos, reveling, but he's drinking socially. And this is, I believe, exactly what Paul is warning about. We don't need anything to do with this. It's too dangerous. It is too uh, controlling. It can get a, a hold of us and go further than we think it is going to go. 
and we've spent enough lifetime filling, uh, fooling around with this and we just don't need to do it anymore. In the book of Proverbs chapter 23, an excellent chapter to give us the dangers of alcohol and what it can do. Some of the wise sayings that were given by a father to his son. He said, hear my son and be wise. Direct your heart in the way. Be not among drunkards. Not only don't be drunk, be not among drunkards. Don't be a part of this atmosphere or among gluttonous eaters of meat. For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty and slumber will clothe them with rags. We see this all of the time in connection with alcohol. The poverty, the destruction, the loss in life. He says, listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when she is old. Buy truth and do not sell it. Buy wisdom, instruction, and understanding. He's saying, listen to what I'm telling you. Alcohol has its allure. Just like we said in connection with sin, it will draw you in. I think as I mentioned in, at the end of Bible class, some of the best commercials as far as production are almost always those in connection with alcohol. When you get to the Super Bowl ads and all, think about how, how well some of these ads are done. And they are appealing. They are drawing people in, trying to make this look as something that is harmless, something uh, that, that is good and, and uh, that you don't need to be afraid of. They don't tell you the truth. They don't show you the real picture. Not the picture that's shown here in Proverbs 23, beginning in verse 29. Listen to what he says. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who tarry long over wine. Those who go to try mixed wine. Do not look at the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup. When it goes down smoothly. Now what's he saying? Here's the appeal of wine. You know, a glass of wine itself, sitting on a table, looks pretty alluring. It looks, looks beautiful. The color is gorgeous. Don't look at the wine when it's red. Or when he said it sparkles in the cup. You know, again, it's very alluring and attractive. Just like the fruit that Eve was looking at. Was beautiful, as Satan said to behold. Very attractive. Goes down smoothly. So again, he's talking about all of the appeal here, all of the things that draw you in. But then he goes on to say, you know, the one that goes after this has the woe, has the sorrow, has the strife, uh, has complaining, has wounds without cause and redness of eyes. Who is this? Those who tarry long over wine. Those who try mixed wine. And then he says in verse 32, in the end it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes will see strange things. Your heart utter perverse things. You will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, like one who lies on the top of a mast. They struck me, you will say, but I was not hurt. They beat me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake? I must have another drink. Here he is listing the fruits of alcohol. What comes from it? Woe, he said. Woe will come. Sorrow will come. Strife will come. Think of the number of people who've been involved in, in tremendous strife or fights or quarrels over alcohol and how many relationships have been destroyed by it. Think of the wounds. Now, this would include all of those that uh, happen on the highways. Uh, that, that we travel day in and day out. The number of people that are killed by alcoholic drivers. Those that are consumed and under the control of it. And the wounds that come, the redness of eyes. The, then he said the biting like a serpent. You know, it lures us in, it's attractive, but then it has a bite to it. It has a sting to it, like an adder. And then he says, you will see strange things. You will utter perverse things. You will say things that you would not normally say. See things that aren't really even there. But then in the end, in spite of all of its consequences and the evil that comes from it, the addiction takes over and I must have another drink. That's the point that he is making here. It is very appealing, very alluring will draw us in and take over. Addiction is defined by dictionary.com as the state of being enslaved 
to a habit or practice. And that's what we're talking about, just as we discussed in the addictive nature of sin. We choose to get involved. We choose to become a part of it, but then it takes over. We become the slave to the habit or to the practice that is involved here. Or physically habit-forming things like narcotics to such an extent that it's cessation. Trying to stop, trying to quit causes severe trauma. So much so that you know, those trying to get off of the effects of it when it gets bad enough have to have professional treatment often. Go into treatment facilities. Try to get rid of the chemical addiction that is involved here. As we mentioned in our beginning lesson, there are two kinds of addiction, chemical and psychological. Obviously, in connection with alcohol, uh, unlike gambling, alcoholism is a chemical addiction. It's the chemical itself that we take into our body that changes us, that begins to take over and rule and control the life. An alcoholic is defined as a person who suffers from a strong physical desire to consume alcohol beyond their ability or their capacity to control it. Why? Because now the brain itself has changed, changed by the alcohol. And where I had the ability before I ever got involved with it, to make a decision whether to either be a part of it or not. Just like General William Henry Harrison said, I will not take a part of it. I will not drink it no matter what you say. He could exercise that choice. Had he given in, he understood that he might be one more of the 16 that became the drunk and died a drunkard's death and was in a drunkard's grave. So again, they suffer beyond their ability to control it after after they make the decision to bring it into their life and to become a part of it. We hear a term continually about the disease of alcoholism. And I'm not doubting that it appears very much like a disease, but if it is, it's a self-induced disease. It's one we choose to invite into our life, knowing the dangers when we do so, if we are wise and if we listen and look at the evidence that is all around us. So they lose that ability and it causes still all of these problems we've been talking about, serious problems at home, on the job, financially, whatever. But in spite of that, and in spite of the hatred for what it's doing to their life, they go back time and time again. Why is that? Because alcohol addiction happens in the brain. The ability to say no changes because the brain changes. It changes in complex ways, making it very difficult, if not impossible, without a lot of help to learn to live without the alcohol. I'm told that it is similar to an electrical system, like our brain is basically an electrical system. And the drugs we take in change the circuits in the brain, which control the addicted person's power of choice. In other words, the more they become a part of it, the more that it is taken in and used in their body, less and less ability there is left to say no, because the brain changes. This is why 17 million Americans are said to either abuse or be dependent on alcohol. Think about that, again, by choice. 17 million. We're told that 50% of North Americans consume more alcohol than the worldwide average. This is a real problem in our world, a real problem in our country. A number of people do not uh, use it at all, but just those who do consume more alcohol than the entire worldwide average. One of the real problems on the majority of college campuses today is something called binge drinking. It's one uh, of the most serious public health problems, uh, again, we're told, confronting our college campuses. Binge drinking occurs when a man will consume more than eight units of alcohol or a woman more than six at one sitting. Again, thinking nothing about that. Binge drinking is neurotoxic, we're told, by medical uh, professionals, and data suggests that serious heart or cardiovascular consequences will be seen by young adults as a result of this. But again, they're not thinking about that at the time. They don't know the real facts. They're not really thinking about what it will do. But our brain is a very complex thing, a wonderfully made thing by God. 
Uh, we've got a young man that uh, one of the uh, members of the church where I preach that uh, is currently in medical school and he's been focusing highly on the brain lately. And his comment was that the brain is so complex that it is, it's, it's as complex as the entire rest of the body by itself. But it has several different lobes or parts to it. One is the frontal lobe. And in the frontal lobe, what happens when we take alcohol into the brain is it begins to remove inhibitions because of this particular part of the brain. In other words, you start doing things that normally you wouldn't do. You have the common sense not to do certain things in public. But as the alcohol is, is added to the brain, then the brain starts losing these inhibitions. And that's why we might start doing stupid things that we normally would not do at all. And we began to lose self-control. Why is it that young men trying to get young women to do things that they know they will not normally do will introduce alcohol? And then it removes the inhibition. It causes the loss of the ability to say no the loss of self-control, weakening the willpower. All of this, we're told, is in the frontal lobe of the brain. And this is how uh, it works on the brain. It weakens the willpower. It dulls attention. You start having a problem focusing, really having attention where you need it to be, be uh, like in driving, because of the effect it has on the frontal lobe. Then there's the parietal lobe, another part of the brain that involves sensory control. And this is what alcohol does to this part of the brain. Works on the sensory nerves and unsteady movement is because this part of the brain is affected. You, you know, that's why the policeman says, walk on this white line right here. I want to I wanna see if you can walk this straight line. Well, if you're having problem with sensory and, and movement and unsteadiness, you can't do that under the effect of alcohol. It destroys your ability to do, to do that. And furthermore, you can't speak like you normally do because this part of the brain is affected by the alcohol, speech disturbance. Then the occipital lobe involves visual sensation. When you start seeing things that aren't really there and you start getting these crazy visions because of the alcohol, it's because of this part of the brain causes visual sensations and distorted images. You start seeing two of, of things rather than one. And, why is it? Because the effect alcohol has on this part of the brain. Seeing double and having a problem understanding how deep something is. Normally you don't have a problem with that. God created a brain that can judge depth, that sees one when there is one and two when there's only really two there, not when one is there. In other words, we don't need this. We don't need this effect on the brain, but this is what happens because of the alcohol. And then the cerebellum involves coordination. Equilibrium, again, the ability to, to stand and to walk and, and to have, you know, normal function for the body, controlled by this part of the brain, affected by alcohol. And then in the center part, this is where respiration is controlled. And uh, literally the alcohol can begin to repress the ability to breathe effectively in the way that we should and we get to certain things that become very very dangerous and how many times how many times in binge drinking will the college students go this far and end up losing their life literally because of the choice they made and it's because in this part of the brain the respiration begins to be affected the circulation begins to be affected and they fall into a state of apathy or this stupor where there's really no ability to function anymore, and finally the end result can literally be death. We understand that, and it's mainly because of this particular part of the brain. How bad can this be? 5,000 people in a recent study, 5,000 people under the age of 21, we're told, die each year from alcohol-related car crashes, because they're under the effect of alcohol, homicides, suicides, alcohol poisoning, and other injuries such as falls, burns, and drowning. 5,000 needless deaths a year. Think about it. And when they got involved in it, when they went down that road, this was not what they thought the end would be. No one told them about these consequences. The NHTSA in their data says almost every 90 seconds a person is injured in a drunk driving crash. 
This is just amazing to me. And again, how many adults think there's nothing wrong with going out and going to the bar or going to the restaurant, loading myself up with alcohol, and then not giving it a thought about going out, getting back under the wheel and driving, as if it will not happen to me. But every 90 seconds someone is injured in a drunk driving crash. And on average, one in three people will be involved in a drunk driving crash. That means that you may not be drunk. You may be behaving yourself. You may be in complete control of your body and your vehicle, but you end up being hit by someone else. Isn't that staggering? One out of three can expect in their lifetime to be involved in a drunk driving crash. The problems linked to alcohol addiction are extensive. They affect a person physically, psychologically, and socially, without a doubt. But I suggest to you that as bad as all of these problems are, they are not the worst consequence associated with alcohol. The severest and longest lasting consequences connected with alcohol are spiritual in their nature. It's not what they do so much to the body as what they do to the soul of man. Addiction is a sin. There are few substances in this life that one can become more addicted to more readily than alcohol. It is a major problem in our world, but the problem here is the addiction to anything for a child of God. Paul in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 12 said, I will not be brought under the power of any. The one that goes to the alcohol cannot say that. We've already shown the effect that it has on the brain. And this is the problem, addiction, giving over, allowing your, yourself, your mind, your body to be controlled by anything. You are to maintain self-control. But one of the biggest lies connected with the use of alcohol is that you can control it and not be controlled by it. Even W.C. Fields in a humorous way years ago said, it's easy to quit drinking. I've done it hundreds of times. That was his line. And that's the line that the alcoholic is constantly telling himself, I can quit any time I want to. I just don't want to. And when is he going to want to is the problem. It's the big lie of Satan that you can control it. And the alcoholic is often the last one to know or realize that he actually has a problem. And again, it is not always in the large amounts, but a study by the University of California at San Diego The sociologist said even small amounts of alcohol cause loss of control. And that's where the child of God doesn't need to go. In the same study, it said even 0.01% of blood alcohol levels is enough to increase the odds of a deadly accident. What is the safe level? Zero. That's what we're saying. That's the safe level. That's where you know if you don't take the first drink, you will not become an alcoholic. You don't take the first drink, you won't have to be under the influence or the control or the effects of it. And so many individuals will go to things like Jesus turning water to wine or Paul talking to Timothy about taking a little wine for your stomach's sake or things of this nature. And they don't realize That in the word of God, the word wine is used for everything from fresh, squeezed, pure grape juice to the very uh, hard or, or the very old wine that basically has become exceedingly bitter and more like vinegar than wine. And our use of the word wine, we think of it, of course, in a modern day sense, and we think of the very, um, the, the very, Uh, alcoholic and content uh, beverage here that that is common in our world and it's not even a second cousin to what was involved in the Bible days. If you take pure grape juice and let it ferment till it's full level by nature, it will never get anywhere near the content of the alcohol that is in today's wines that are done uh, by adding things to it to increase its alcoholic level. And there are many times in the Word of God, and you have to go to the context to determine this, but many times in the Word of God where the word wine will not refer to an alcoholic beverage at all, but to fresh, pure, squeezed grape juice. You have to understand that and get down to looking at the facts when you're studying the Word of God in regard to these things. Even small amounts 
can cause us to lose self-control. One of the biggest lies, again, is that I can control it. Accidents are 36.6 more times severe, we're told, when alcohol is even barely detectable in a driver's blood. This, again, according to studies done nationally by the government. They know these facts. And addiction itself is a sin. Peter, in talking about the Christian graces, as we refer to our Christian virtues, to add to our lives, to grow as a child of God, one of the things he says is you add to your knowledge self-control. And to self-control perseverance. What is that? Well, you don't turn over your mind to a chemical, to a substance. You don't turn over your mind uh, or your body as an instrument to be used to sin with. You don't give it to Satan. You give it to God to be used as an instrument of righteousness. You control your body and you control your passions. You maintain self-control, not being controlled by something else. Colossians 3 and verse 1, uh, he shows here in this passage that a person is controlled by what he sets his mind on. And this is the point then that we're going to be making throughout this study. The mind is what controls the body. And what controls the mind is going to control the whole individual. Colossians 3 and verse 1. Listen to what Paul says. If you then have been raised with Christ, seek the things which are above. Here he's saying set your mind on God and spiritual things. Seek things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Listen, set your minds on things above, not on things on the earth. There's that same contrast between carnal and spiritual. Where are we going to focus? What, what is important to us? What do we love the most? Set your affections or your mind on things above. Why should we do this? Verse 3, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Remember what Peter said? We've spent enough of our last past lifetime living in sin, serving the man of sin, the old man. This man died. He used to be put away. And so since you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God, when Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in, in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So Paul is telling us this, again, is part of living the new life in Christ, that we put on self-control we think about things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. 1 Thessalonians 5 also. He simply gives us very good advice here when he said, let us be sober. Now, I know that that's not talking about specifically not drinking as opposed to drinking. Sober in the sense of that. But he is saying that we're to set our mind properly on the right things. We're to be serious minded. We're not to be giving our mind over to the control of of other things or substances. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 2. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. He's writing to Christians. You know that Jesus is returning again one day. And you know that he's not going to announce ahead of time what it's going to be. It's going to be like the thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But listen, you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. You're to be living with your uh, mind, uh, again, thinking about the right things. You're not to be caught by surprise when it comes to the return of the Lord. He said, you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as do others. Let us keep awake and what? Be sober. Now you think about the control that alcohol can have of the brain. Is that leading to what Paul's talking about here? Is that being sober? Is that living sober-mindedly? Those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk uh, are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate uh, of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to think about that last statement. God has not destined us to wrath. What does it mean? 
You were not created by God and given a life by God so that you could waste it and throw it away and store up for yourself the wrath of God because you choose to walk in the ways of disobedience. We're either storing up for ourselves eternal life to come or the wrath of God. And what he is saying is you were not created by God to go to hell. You were created to be a child of the light, to be saved. Jesus died for you. He didn't give his life for nothing. He wants you to live soberly in control of your mind. To be sober is defined as one untouched by beclouding influences, including alcohol, but are also to have all of their spiritual senses in full exercise. That's what he means. Able to think seriously about serious matters. We have plenty of evidence in the Bible of the evil effects of alcohol and what it can do to an individual. Think about the first sin that occurred that's recorded in the Word of God after God had just cleansed the entire world in the destruction of the flood. Eight souls were saved and right after that, Noah became drunk and led to a major sin from one of his sons uh, that we read about there in the account between Ham and Noah. Noah doing things that he normally wouldn't do in a, in a situation where he wouldn't be because of the beclouded influence of alcohol on his brain. And what about Lot and his daughters in that story in Genesis 19 where no doubt under the effect of, of the influence of Sodom, the daughters saw nothing wrong with committing incest with their own father. But what would allow a father to do that? The influence of alcohol. How did they get their father to do this? Well, they first got him drunk because he would not have done it otherwise. He would not have been involved in such a sin except for the effects of alcohol. And what about Belshazzar? And that story in Daniel chapter 5. Here was a very wicked and foolish ruler who again throws a drunken feast and chooses to use the vessels of God that had been captured from Jerusalem to mock God. And that night, the kingdom is destroyed. Belshazzar sees the handwriting on the wall. But again, the effects of alcohol allowed the uh, conquering enemy to just basically march into the city on the riverbed and take it without a shot because the king was throwing a drunken feast. So the effects of alcohol, again, go way back, long in the history of man. And we're reminded of that verse that we started with in Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 27. Can a man take fire into his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can we play with this and not get burned by it? 17 million people have said they could, and it didn't work too well for them. How many times do we think we can and not have a problem with it? But he warns us here, you're playing with fire. And we need to be very, very careful. Because again, just like with sin, alcohol will take you further than you want to go. These things are not shown in the advertisements. The broken homes, the destroyed marriages... The children, the innocent children that suffer because of a mom or a dad who are addicted to alcohol and lose any ability to be a good parent or to care for anybody else because they're under the control of alcohol. It takes you farther than you ever planned, you ever wanted to go. But it keeps you once it gets you there. To the point that again, it's referred to as a disease, but it's because you've put yourself in a place that you're unable now to free yourself. You have literally changed the chemistry of your own brain because of this substance, and it keeps you there. And you try to get off, and the withdrawal is severe and difficult. And in the end, it costs you far, far more than just the price of that bottle. Now, I want you to think very carefully about what we've been talking about and your personal responsibility in this, and the fact that one of the greatest blessings God has given you is your ability to choose. You can choose to go the wrong way, but you can also choose to go the right way. You can choose to learn the lessons of God the right way, the easy way, and not have to suffer the losses that so many others have. You can choose to be a Christian. You can choose to be like General William Henry Harrison and say, it will not pass my lips. 
And this morning, you can choose to become a Christian if you're not. Make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life. He died for you. He gave his life for you to bring you out of the bondage of sin and the addiction to sin. And just as Paul wrote in the book of Romans, the 8th chapter, or, or when he writes there about that uh, addiction and, and the problems of sin, he identifies Jesus as the answer, the one that can redeem us and can save us. And we hope and pray this morning, if you're not a Christian, you will realize that your hope and help is in turning to the Lord and accepting and obeying Him, being baptized for the forgiveness of sins if you need to. Or if as a Christian you've found yourself under the control of sin and again your only answer is to come back to the Lord and seek His forgiveness and His help. He's ready and willing to receive you. If you're subject to the invitation, won't you come while we stand and sing?